Um, here we go. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Hollywood Critics Association Women of the Movement After Show. You guys are coming off of two hours of just the most intense show out there. So we're here to help you kind of break things down and to kind of conceptualize some of this stuff. Get in the comments on YouTube and talk back to us, ask questions, um, because we're just going to have a discussion. Um, I'm Jonita Davis. Um, and, and in addition to being in the HCA, I also do a podcast called Creators in COVID. And you can find my work at theblackcape.com. Let me pull in my co host Let's see. First, we have Giandra. Hi, I'm Giandra LaBeouf. I'm good, Janita. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm Giandra LaBeouf, also an HCA member. I am a freelance writer. You can find me at a few different publications, Rolling Out Black Girl Nerds and Illumin Nerdy. And I'm happy to be here to talk about women in the movement. And then we have KB. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So I am KB, also an HCA member, and I am a freelance entertainment journalist. You can find my content um, at Through the Lens of Lady KB, which is on YouTube. I post all of my interviews there. And then also with various outlets like Complex, uh, The Beat, and Nerdophiles. And that's us. So um, we're just going to uh, have a conversation about the show, ask some questions, um, and then we will also um, have a guest here to help us yes. kind of sort through some of this stuff. Um, Tanya Pinkins is going to be joining us. So um, I want to start out just by asking uh, general thoughts uh, that you had about the show. What did you think overall? I was I was very moved. Uh, we know the story of Emmett Till and what unfortunately happened to him to see it brought together in this episodic form to further explore the steps of what happened when the incident occurred, what led to the incident, and just talk, looking in depth at this moment in history really moved me, made me very sad, And but it is a story that needs telling, particularly on this date, when we have people who still don't respect the people of this country and so it was just a, a it was a, a interesting combination of emotions to to see this on display tonight in particular. Yeah, I think you know for me it was a sense of anticipation and hope. Um, just in the sense that like I was really interested in seeing kind of what they were doing when it came to expanding the story of Mamie Teal. Um, you know, we know how much grief she went through and how hard it, it is to, to not only lose a child, but lose one um, so publicly. Um, and we know how kind of like this tragedy ended up being um, such a huge catalyst in the civil rights movement. So I was interested in seeing just more of Mamie as a woman um, so I'm still interested in seeing more of that. I mean, obviously, we've only seen the first two episodes. Those are the ones that premiere tonight. But um, heaviness is another emotion, like like G. Andrea said. Like it, it's very, um, it's very sad because we know what's going to happen. Like there's almost like a sense of dread just because you're anticipating because you you know that his death is coming. You know that that's going to happen, and so I. During that first episode, I really was just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like I, I felt myself waiting for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I just let out a sigh because I felt that too. Um, just hearing, just knowing that this this is about Emmett Till, and when I heard the conversation at the dinner table about him going south, I, I got dread right there. Right there, it's like okay, it's about to happen. <laughs> and yeah. so that that feeling right there. Um, yeah, and I found it. I found it heavy as well. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do the show and to talk about it um, and to put some kind of context into it. Um, but I also, I also love the way that they, they touched on the motherhood and touched more, went deeper into how Mamie used the media to, you know, make sure that, Oh, they're not going to forget me or him. They're not, well, especially they're, they're not going to forget him. They're not going to forget my baby my baby did not die in vain and this is not going to happen again to anybody else's child you know without them remembering my my child what's going to happen and and one of the things that i think they did well that it was frustrating but i think they did well in the show was it was showing that curtain of silence over the south mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um 
how everybody knew something was going on. Everybody knew what was happening. Everybody knew what was going on, but no one wanted to talk about it at all. You know, no one wanted to acknowledge it. Um, even, even when, uh, warnings were given. Yeah. I mean, so that curtain of silence, um, that, that heavy curtain of silence, I, I love that they were really, you know, kind of drove that home because that is what really, really got her to say, you know, in the, the grand scheme, scheme of the story, we know that that's what got her to say, okay, I'm going to the, to the papers. Y'all I'm not playing. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, there, so there was a lot <laughs> happening with the, with the story. Um, what are some of the things that you think that, you know, that we need to like really to look at right now? Um, some of the things we need to zero in on, maybe a, maybe scenes or concepts or something. Um, what are some of the things that we probably need to pick out and pick up and pick out first? Mm -hmm. I should say. That was, what you just said was particularly interesting to me, uh, Janita, how she did go to the media uh, when we think of those times, there wasn't a lot of support and help for Black issues unless it was a big issue. We, in this ep in episode one, we saw that the NAACP became involved. And being on this side of history, we think about the internet and how what modern media looks like for us today. But just the amount of bravery for her to talk to the media or even their willingness to cover the story at all, because there's always this notion that the North was so awakened to, to black issues and people migrating there and the South was still in just a, the cover of night. And no one really, we've seen the pictures of what ultimately happens to him in the paper headlines. So it was interesting to me that they spent so much time, you know, giving us a little peek at the reporters and the other people who were there to, to tell Emmett's story. Uh, additionally, just rewinding it back a little bit before he left and the incident occurred, the advice that a mother has to give a child before they travel. You know, mothers mm -hmm. tell their children all the time, behave, don't touch things, do this, do that. We as Black people, as we were discussing before we went live, um, of how we as a culture tell our children, you know, be careful, don't do this, don't act up, don't do these things. And she had some very, very specific instructions in him in particular playing small which is still something that I feel like overwhelmingly black people are told to do. You know, don't live out loud, don't be unapologetic, don't be proud, don't don't show pride in your work and just seeing some of the early representations of those conversations that we continue to have now 2022 with our with our own children, our own family is just it, it, it was is a was fascinating spectrum. So early in episode one, that really resonated with me. Well, can I can I just say that even and it's not even with kids, because even as adults <laughs> coming out and into ourselves, because I know you and I, Giandra and I have been on a junket before and you're like, you know, get in there and, you know, get in there and, answer, you know, and, and it's like so even as an adult, I'm having sometimes and when I get nervous, having to be reminded to take up space. To not because that the instinct the instinct is, is to go small, and mm -hmm. this is the root of it. This is where it comes from, you know. Yeah, and you know, I mean, at mm -hmm. the end of the day, adults become um, excuse me, children become adults, and so mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of um, learned behavior that's passed down from generation to generation, and a lot mm -hmm. of these learned conversations. And it's unfortunate because I mean, as we know, like even even in this day with with Trayvon Martin and and George Floyd, like. We know that the respectability politics that we've been playing for hundreds of years that have been passed down, um, you know, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways from our ancestors um, with the hopes of keeping us safe still mm -hmm. don't always work, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it still doesn't matter. And so um, I oftentimes am like, you know, uh, I'm going to take up space because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, like we have more than earned the right to. And so um, I believe in this story, you know, it, you both are right. Like it is, it's heartbreaking to watch, but I think that there's a balance in this story that I really liked in episode one. And I hope we get to see more of an episode two and, and, and I'm not sure how, and maybe we'll see it through flashbacks 
was kind of this balance of trauma versus joy. You know, as, mm -hmm. as much trauma as we experience as Black people, I think it is um, wildly important for us to see moments of joy. And I'm going to reference one show that I think did a good job of doing that um, kind of in the similar space, but the Underground Railroad. I, mm -hmm. I felt like mm -hmm. just having an mm -hmm. opportunity to see Black love in this light. Like, I, I mm -hmm. absolutely adored the relationship um, that we get to see between Mamie and her mom. Like, I adore that because they are so close and the conversations mm -hmm. that they're having, you know, prior to his, um, you know, disappearance and, and death, like they're just having such rich, wonderful conversations between a mother and a daughter. I love that. I actually also really enjoy Mamie's relationship with Jean and seeing that in episode one, because, you know, Jean is not Emmett's biological father but the way he interacts with Emmett, the way he interacts with Mamie, um, their palpable, uh, palpable love that you can see on screen. I actually really like that. So balancing that and then, you know, Emmett having kind of that black boy joy when he's singing, I think that's one of the best scenes too, of just allowing us to get to know Emmett as just being the boy that he was. He's outside with his friends. He's singing to a group of girls. He acting like a little Lothario. You like, sir, if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> like in this house, what are you out here doing? He out here to show, but you know, he's being himself and mm -hmm. just having that moment. And you can see the pride in her eyes watching this son that they wanted her to give up on, just living in that freedom that she says she wanted him to have, mm -hmm. having that moment of freedom and him being so excited to go to Mississippi because he's like, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> I, I like I I'm, I'm excited. I want to go on vacation. Ooh, and him I was like, even reminding no her. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. But even him reminding her to enjoy herself and enjoy her friends and her friends saying, like, girl, you talk about your kid a lot for someone who's supposed to be on vacation because their son's on vacation. Don't you just want to be free? So I like having the balance of that because it is important for us to be able to see images of ourselves, not just in the present, but even of the past, like uh, of us being able to see ourselves reflected in joy as well. Mm -hmm. that, that touched me in particular because I only have one child as well and I get it. I understand. You just want to hold them, you know, not mm -hmm. that multiple children, you just fling them out the door or anything like that. But it was, <laughs> with your only one, it's hard. It's hard to let them go. And they're in an era, people, everybody didn't even have a phone yet. And you're just letting them go. Mm -hmm. You're just letting them go to a place that brings you a lot of internalized trauma that you haven't even dealt with. And you're sending mm -hmm. your beloved back to a place, which was another thing that was interesting. They've been trying to take this child from her, from her birth, from his birth. They were trying and she's sending him back without her to be mm -hmm. his guardian, to be to speak for him to advocate for him and uh just it, it's completely heartbreaking which you bring up a good point because actually that very first scene of episode one is one of the most harrowing for me and we know how high the rates are of um you know when it comes to black women dying during childbirth mm -hmm. and how they treated her and how she needed to have an advocate this is why i always advocate for a doula because you know the fact that her mom had to step in and really advocate for her, she could have died before he was even born because That's of the right. way they were treating her in that hospital and basically just saying, you deal with the pain. Like the pain is fine. You're fine. Nothing's happening. And he's basically, you know, bursting to come out by the time they they get to her. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, it's really like even, even those things and even just kind of seeing how we as Black women um, are treated in every single space, you know, um, in the world, even in healthcare and when it comes to our issues, mm -hmm. seeing that from the beginning and bringing that to the surface was um, really, really um, important to see, I think, in this series too. Oh, yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Deandra. No, I was ag agree. I'm just agreeing with you because they really packed in a lot in that episode, that in episode one, that we are still experiencing medical care. Just looking at the baby, mm -hmm. uh, salute to director Gina Price by the way for that episode mm -hmm. and just seeing that baby's face with where they clearly took forceps and just mm -hmm. yanked him out without any care. The nurse doesn't care. Her mother's there. She can barely mm -hmm. speak. She's just drowned in sweat. She can't even have some water. 
I mean, just from the onset, salute to them with the crafting of this by packing in those important messages that people, Black women are still largely affected by poor health care or people not advocating or people minimizing their pain or our responses to pain, like we're not human, like we're animals. And just getting that into that episode was critical, but it, it was it was perfectly placed. It wasn't like, let's just pick some random topics and put them mm -hmm. in. You know, it, it fit in the whole storytelling and how this child was almost marked from the beginning and literally from the beginning. So let, let me, let me uh, put a pause right here and pull in somebody who I think might shed some light on, you know, that, that scene in particular, and then some of the others. And then, you know, the, the discussion we started with um, the support that Mamie and her mom had that, that connection, that relationship. So let me bring in Miss Tanya Pinkins. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, we we were just well. You heard the I was conversation. To you, yes. Yeah, you, you heard it. Okay. It took so me a um, bit to get into Streamyard, but I finally <laughs> found the computer and the thing to get on Chrome. <laughs> awesome. That's amazing. Um, so. Can, what can you tell us about this scene and um, what we were seeing with the birth and with the doctors and, you know, everything that was kind of going on? I think that it's the power of having women as the writer and the directors, Black women telling this story. And so there are moments that only we know. If you aren't a Black woman and a mother, you don't know what those moments are. How would you even begin to write those moments? So uh, that is really what allowed that to happen. And Marissa is just kind of amazing. Um, there's so many detailed moments, like the moment when they're waiting on the porch for them to bring him back. That moment just tears me up. Like if white people had written that, that, that is a moment we wouldn't have had. There's so many of moments that just a white gaze would not have thought to let us see those moments. Even his wife, you know, waiting there for him or just hearing that they done sent the family everybody they done sent everybody away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah all those little details which are the nuances of our daily life that that just don't happen in most storytelling let me ask mm -hmm. you this you know this story is so important for people to see but it's also so heavy so what was it like on set being able mm -hmm. to balance like the importance of the storytelling with managing your own kind of emotional needs and mental health needs when it comes to stepping into um, you know these real life figures it was just hard it was excruciatingly painful there's just no other way around it you can't you can't half do this. And we were living in Mississippi, in mm. Greenwood, where it happened. You were you were living oh. there. Oh yeah, for for three months, for almost four months. Oh wow! Oh, yeah. yeah, it was um, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I mean, we had. I was trying to post some videos of when we had fun because we did have to have fun. But you know, you're walking into you're just walking into hell every day. Um, because that's where you have to live, because that's what that is. And they made a space that was safe for us to do that. And they had uh, different, you know, therapists and, and care people to help people um, on the really, really tough days. But I'd never been to Mississippi. My family is from Mississippi. And honestly, we got there in winter and the trees looked angry. They just all looked like, like <laughs> you know, the trees you know, look angry. The trees just look angry. You're just like, yeah, I, I, like most of these trees, probably somebody was lynched on these trees. Mm, because, yes. um, mm. That is the history of that place. And I had a lot of downtime because I'm not in the next two episodes, which are the trial. And so I just did a lot of time exploring Mississippi and learning its history. And, you know, Emmett wasn't the first 14 year old boy. Um, it was just, you know, business as usual for a, a white man to just get mad at a black person and just kill him and throw him in the river. When they pulled Goodman, Cheney and Schwerner out of the river, they pulled nine other black men out of the river before they found the three of them and just stopped. Mm. That's how many of us were in the river. Mm. 
And the, um, I think the month after Emmett was killed, there was a black man doing gas. I can't remember his name. There's a marker for him. But um, he filled up this man's tank as he was asked to do. And the man didn't have enough money. And so he just said, I'm going to kill you. And he came back and shot him. And his wife um, was going to testify in court. And so they ran her off the road into the river, leaving all of their children orphaned. And nothing was ever done. That is just, that was normal. That's what you expected in Mississippi. They could just kill people with impunity. I don't know if any of you have seen the Life magazine interview where they actually confess mm -hmm. and say mm -hmm. they, you know, they knew they weren't even worried about it. And the no. magazine draws drawing of Emmett makes him look like a little werewolf or something on the ground, naked with all this hair. Just, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, they weren't worried yeah. because they knew be, because of double jeopardy, you know, nothing could be, they were untouchable, essentially. Yeah. Well, not and just double so, jeopardy, because of racism, nobody right. was going mean, to do anything. Both, but, yeah. but, but from yeah. a legal perspective, because mm -hmm. they had already been acquitted, it was like, well, we can do what we want to do, you know, and so, like, let's go ahead and confess in this major magazine that we actually did this heinous act. Mm -hmm. Right, Tanya you, Tanya, you said you had gone exploring out there. What is even the tenor of a town like that? Because obviously this is not that long ago. People act like racism. All the pictures of racist acts are always in black and white. So they make it seem like it's ancient history. You rarely see colored pictures of racist acts in any type of magazine, historical text to make it seem like it's just a separate part of history. These people obviously have descendants and people who probably still live in that town. So what is the Carol what was Ryan, the, I think still lives in that town. Mm. Um, you know, it was a rude awakening for me. Um, it really helped me understand what states' rights means and how people who live in a different state actually can live in a different country than you because mm -hmm. states have the rights. And so you know, I'm down there in Mississippi and and, you know, this is no offense. I am not a reality television girl. I just didn't ever understand it. But when I got down to Mississippi to see that there are people still living in what like were former slave shacks, like reality television is aspirational mm. because the people are living two steps out of slavery. Mm -hmm. When we went, we had to eat out all the time because there was no communal me meals. You know, you go to a restaurant, white people sitting there eating unmasked and we're all the workers. Um, it's a food desert. So mm. 100 miles, to, you, you won't find a grocery store. And so Walmart is all you got. And we know Walmart doesn't give people full time employment. So people who work at Walmart work part time and then they got to get welfare. Um, in Mississippi, I, I found a relative, Ty Pinkins, who has a wonderful book about being a sharecropper and then going in the military. And then he was in Obama's White House. And then he came back and uh, was went to law school and is came back home to basically help Mississippi because Mississippi is one of those states that won't accept the federal government aid. Mm -hmm. We don't want yeah, people, it's to a red state. people to mm -hmm. rise up. And so one of the things that he took me around and showed me is that like the hospitals don't have to charge you full price if you're poor, but they also don't have to tell you that. And so what happens mm -hmm. for black people is you get sick, you go to the hospital, you get charged this huge amount of money that you could never pay. You take out one of these payday loans, you fall behind, and then they're suing you and you go to court against a hospital with their lawyer. And the judges don't even have to have gone to law school or be lawyers. Mm -hmm. The judges can just have a GED or a high school degree. And that's who your lawyer is. And he's like, people don't even know that if the plaintiffs don't show up, they can say default or they can say this is the wrong amount. Like people don't even know that they have any rights at all. Right. We talked, um, I talked earlier about this cloud of secrecy, you know, that's over there that, that, that maybe kind of broke through when she's like, show them up. It seems it's still there. And I think it's, it's still hiding a lot. So I, that's one of the things I like about this show is it's it's bringing out even your stories. I think I hope it brings out more stories, uh, you know, of people that are talking about what's happening. But it's bringing out stories of people saying, OK, this stuff is not that far. And like you said, they're just a few steps away from, you know, when, you know, freedom came. So we need to be talking about this. And hope that that's my hope is that we keep talking because that that cloud of secrecy is still there. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. my family has there's a road called Pinkins Road and they own land. 
you can't use your land as collateral to get uh, uh, money to build a house. So they all live in trailers. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's, it's really, really sad that it's still that way. And we were, we also <laughs> talked about earlier how this show is shows how the root of a lot of stuff that we still go through today, you know, um, people are watching this again <laughs> thinking it's it's really really far back in the past and no. we see stuff i mean and you're and you're telling us you saw with your, your with your own eyes it, it hasn't changed no it hasn't and you know i love the way she got the way they talk without talking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know the way they asked the question to not get the answer like she got all of that mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. with the, when they come to pick her up well you should tell your story and how they're already telling her how she needs to tell her story without ever saying it. I mean, that's how 45 did it. That's that if anything keeps him out of jail, it's going to be because he never had to say anything. Mm -hmm. Everybody understood what was meant. Everybody understood. That's yeah, why I like the, the media telling her, you know, make sure you keep saying these words. He was, you know, your child and your boy, you know, you say those words and keep that at the forefront. I love that little part when I saw that and because like you said it's saying it without saying it and but again I think it's it's only a black journalist who could have told her that mm -hmm. do you know what I mean mm -hmm. you know there's mm -hmm. there's no other way around it I mean a white journalist during that time wouldn't have given her that information or that knowledge because they were not concerned about maintaining the integrity of this child's life and they wouldn't legacy. have thought of him as a child exactly At all. Well, At quite all. frankly, they weren't thinking of him as a human being. I mean, that's right. the reality. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes out in the next episode that is that the reason that uh, they were acquitted was that they said, you can't prove that this is Emmett. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. But remember, everything yeah. was working together in their favor mm -hmm. as it does when you are working under uh, white supremacy, because even, you know, the mortician didn't even we don't even need to we don't need to do anything with this body. Like we don't need to formally identify that it's him. We don't need to. I mean, the length that he was going through just to to just be done with Emmett's body and not even have to do that. So that way he wouldn't have to, he wouldn't be held responsible in any capacity. You don't have mm -hmm. to testify against your friends. You don't have to do any of that. And even when it came to the sheriff having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him in the car, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the law and basically saying, okay, so what did you do? And, and really asking him without asking him, tell me everything so I can cover for you if need be. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just yep. a complete, utter disregard of black life. And even then, even when they knew they didn't have the right black person, that ah, doesn't matter. They're interchangeable. Got one. It's fine. It's fine. Just throw them in the ground. Doesn't even matter. That's mm -hmm. why they didn't want to see anybody to see the body so they could have that to fall back on later. It's disgusting. Yeah. And, and that's, that's one of the things that, you know, I want to talk about is the, how she finally got the idea, got, got it that the media needed to be used to show his face and show his and every but and everybody was the way everybody was telling i think that comes out it comes out later just how they were trying to get to get her not to do it um i think that it shows how you know again another realm she's not just a black lady a black you know person going through this she's a black woman and there's a lot of gender bias with, you know, telling her what she could and could not do and how she could and could not do it. Even when and when dealing with the media, yeah, the, you know, they told her there was a lot of things that I'm glad that some of them took her aside and told her. But there were a lot of things that they just kind of, you know, wanted her just kind of understood that she would just do what, what was she was told and just kind of go about her way. Um, uh, Tanya, can you talk about her and her mother and that dynamic where they they kind of subverted a little bit of those gender roles of the time? Um, well, you know, they these were some some strong strong uh, black women. Um, uh, Alma Carthen was one of the founders of the Churches of God and Christ in America, mm -hmm. and in many ways, Mamie and Emmett were like her kids. It, it like I grew up as my grandmother's child. My mother had me very young. And so my aunts and uncles sort of think of me as a sister and their kids are like my nieces and nephews, even though that's not the biology of it, but that's the way it was. Emmett used to go to Mississippi with Alma 
And so um, this was really a turning point in Mamie's life because Alma had lived through Mississippi for real and, and she just couldn't do it. And so Mamie had to, to, to become a woman. And, you know, I think it's there. I don't feel like it's brought home as strongly enough that she risked her family's life. Like they told Mose what was going to happen to him. Mm -hmm. And so she's defying the law. She's defying the patriarchy. She's defying white supremacy. She was just like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it comes up later, maybe in, in the last two episodes, um, just how uh, deep that went because there's an exchange between um, Mamie and her mom that, you know, kind of brought it, brought it home to me that this is real. This is, if, if you weren't, if you didn't know, just how real it was there's they have an exchange where you you know what time it is um and you know how much that she's uh sacrificing so that that intensity is there um that it, it's so there so we've got all these intersections right here um so much in in one series um as you guys were putting it together was there any concern that it would be too much for people to get I don't think so. And I think that um, uh, Marissa said, no, they never said no. Like when she made her presentation with Gina, uh, first of all, you know, when we do things, we do them like, like we don't do it like they do it. Okay. So she said they had a score, like they went in and it was like a, a production. Their pitch was a production mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the, the network like bought it on that pitch. And pretty much, she said, got out of her way. You know, I think that the only places where there were challenges is, you know, they got to have their commercial breaks. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what you can get in with the commercial breaks and then, you know, what will they allow you for the budget, for the score? I mean, those are the only places where I heard that um, there were challenges. But like, you know, they built those cotton fields. Our production designer, her name is Michelle. Do you know what it is? But honey, she was designing her butt off. Oh. I was wondering about that, if that about was that, a real yeah. cotton field, because it looked incredible. Mm -hmm. Made in the wintertime. Oh my goodness. And put out there. Goodness. Oh Tanya, goodness. Is, is, there, is there a portion of the story that you wish, you know, that you could have spent more time on that we would be able to see that, you know, mm -hmm. that we aren't going to be able to see through the course of these six episodes? There are things, but you know, Keith Beauchamp has an Emmett Till movie coming out. And so a lot of the things that I learned about the history, I learned from Keith Beauchamp. He is like a historian. He knew Mamie and he knows a lot. And so I think some of that is going to come out in that Emmett Till movie that I think Whoopi Goldberg is in. Um, mm -hmm. Like the fact that they drove all over just grabbing black boys and, th and beating them up and throwing them out of trucks like people nearly like lost their arms. So there were a whole bunch of black boys that were abused on that night um, that we don't, you know, we don't really get to go into that. The f that I don't know that we go into much detail about the black men who were involved. You get the, the little glimpse of that one black right. man who works for them, but um, you know, you won't go through the fact that there were 14 other men involved and that Emmett was taken from town to town and beaten and tortured. And they literally chopped on his nose with a, a, a hatchet and they knocked all of his teeth out of his mouth. And uh, before they, so they tortured him for hours. Um, there was one man who, you know, black people worked, um, you know, on that land that was uh, the Bryant's Milam's land. And one man, he just talked about hearing this little boy being tortured for hours and that he just fled north and it just it made him so sick he fled north and had a nervous breakdown mm. you know yeah there is a, oh Go i'm ahead. sorry there is, there ahead. is a portion of the it's just like a second where you hear um glenn terman's mose say i i know that there was another black person there but he didn't want me to see him 
And it is just like that small bid and you you kind of get the bit where um, you see the gentleman who works for him, you know, approach all of the boys in the streets just so he can identify because, you know, that's what he's doing. He mm -hmm. since he works for him, he's just trying to identify which one is Emmett. And then when to hear Mo say, oh, I, I definitely saw him, but he didn't want me to see him. It was just it's heartbreaking. Well, Mayor Johnny Thompson of Glendora, Mississippi, he's been the mayor there now for about 30, 40 years. And that man has nine lives. It's unbelievable that he's there. But he says in his book, and I, I spent a day with, with, with Mayor Thompson, uh, that his father was one of the men who worked for Milam who participated. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, wow. what they did was they you know, took those black men out of town and held them in jail cells so that no one could find them during the course of the investigation. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. And they they have a story themselves. I, I'm I'm certain because oh, you know yeah. John Thompson said Milam came in their house when he was a child, and his mother was sick one day, and he beat her down in front of the children because she was sick and couldn't get out in his fields. Mm -hmm. That that's one of the things I love about this this series is it doesn't go in on those black men. I mean, we don't we don't get a microscope, you know, pawing at them um, because they're victims as well. You know, <laughs> it's not like they had a choice. It's not like any of them could do could say, no, I don't want to do this. Um, so, I mean, there was like a, a, a mention um, I saw on social media about, you know, somebody said something about black men were in, in this. I'm like thinking, OK, we don't even need to go there because, I mean, that's victim blaming right there, right there. Yeah. yeah, and we we don't. That's part of what 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 white supremacy does is they made us harm each other. I mean, Fannie Lou Hammer talks about how they made those black men beat her in that jail. You know, that mm -hmm. is one of the things they did. Um, one of the things I want to touch on too is the violence, and the we don't get, we don't see a lot of it here, which I I appreciate. I appreciate that you feel it, you hear it. But, you know, we don't have to, to see bodies getting beaten up. Was there any discussion while you guys were filming about how that was going to happen and, and how that was going to take place? I appreciate it, but I'm, I'm wondering, is there like an explanation given or was there was it a conscious decision or was it made before you got there? And actually, can I add a little something to her question? Because there is a deliberate choice to show his body in the series, mm -hmm. which actually I think shocked me a little bit because we didn't see the violence. So just having that. So if you could talk a little bit about that. That too. Yep. Marissa was very clear that she did not want to do a true crime show. Mm -hmm. She wanted to do a family drama. And for me, what is the most beautiful thing about it is all those wonderful, joyful moments that you were talking about him out there singing to the girls. And I think it makes it more heartbreaking when you see that this was a kid with so much, you know, going for him and the, the kids all on the farm and they feel they're safe in Mississippi. And, you know, I, I feel like that choice to give you all that joy was really important. So for her, it was really important that it was a family drama and that it was a family drama through the mother's eyes. That was what was important to her. And, you know, she's going back, she's using the body as the bookend, as they shot it, edited it, for her looking at her baby. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, she did that. Like, she still loved her baby, no matter what condition he was in, he was still her baby. And she took the time to touch him and, she writes about how, you know, no teeth in his mouth. He had the most beautiful teeth and they were gone and that they had chopped off his nose. And like she looked at every detail of her baby. She knew her baby's body. And so, you know, the, the, the insult of them saying it's not her child when she has examined this brutalized body from inch to inch, she knows it's her baby. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and and baby, I love the way that the, the baby, the glimpses of a baby, you see mm -hmm. this corpse, but then you see this precious little, this baby foot, you know, um, and that drives it home even deeper that this is her baby. This is her child. And I think it makes, it takes, I mean, the, the, the body is intense. It is intense seeing it, but I think it takes some of the intensity off to see the, the baby, the actual infant parts, you know, kind of juxtaposed. In, in those moments, 
you know, right next to one another. So I love seeing that part. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just, just say some kudos to, to Adrian Warren, who mm -hmm. just took my heart just from tenderness to, to, I shared her anger, to mm -hmm. sadness, to strength, to, she took, she, her performance was wonderful. Yes. She, she truly moved me just the range of, of emotions that she had to convey in every, every scene, a spectrum of emotions from fear to love, to, to pride, to in every single moment after he left her sight, she did a, a beautiful, beautiful job. Yes, she did. She, she did. did. So I, I just love this. I love this show. <laughs> I just love this show. I mean, it's really, it's really, really intense and it's a lot, but I, I still love this show. I feel um, like it could be the roots of our generation. Mm. It could be. I, I really think it could be because you do have that element where, it, you know, a, lot, a wide range of the family could watch it. This is being experienced by a lot of people who have like older kids, you know, um, if your kid watched Spider-Man, the Spider-Man movie, uh, they, they can sit in front of this. They can mm -hmm. watch it, you know? So I think that this could be that, that movie that like roots. Yeah. Yeah. How does it feel to be in a movie like this? that, you know, is getting so much recognition and, and has so much of the history in it. It's, it's a privilege always to get to tell something well. And uh, I think that they really did tell this story well. You know, so often you are in these things and it's like, oh, it's, a, it's some made up new version kind of thing. But I feel that um, Marissa really did tell the truth and, and honor us and uplift us and show us in our complexity. And um, so I feel proud of it because it feels like an authentic black gaze, it very much like I felt about um, Black and Missing, which is also was all written and directed by all black women. You see that that is just a whole nother way of storytelling when we are at the helm. Can I just ask you, you know, from this experience for you personally, what did you take away from this experience that you will take with you moving forward? And whether that be professionally into other projects or whether it just be personally in your own life? Because, I mean, you did talk about how you got to connect to your family in Mississippi, which is already huge. Um, just, you know, being able to take on this body of work that's going to be a lasting, impactful body of work and also connecting with your family. So kind of what else were you able to take away from this project? You said that with such hope and inspiration. I know. She's, what, she's... <laughs> what I took away from this project is I have to get the hell out of America. And I now live in Panama. Mm. Ooh, I like Panama. That's... I'm going to visit you. Yeah. I live right on the canal. Come on. I got a beautiful yes. place. Right Listen, I love Panama. Mm -hmm. It's a and it's a beautiful place. I know it's off topic, but it's a beautiful place to see us represented. Mm -hmm. So many times people are like, you know, um, oh no, but I mean, I in that same trip went to Panama and Colombia and getting to see the different hues of of us there as well is just a really beautiful experience. So yes, girl, enjoy Panama. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Mississippi, right. Mississippi wore me out. I mean, the powerlessness of being able to do anything about that and knowing. It, the powerlessness is always just too much for me and being so aware of my privilege, which I'm totally aware of here in Panama because America, you know, colonized and brutalized Panama, but the yeah. people here in Panama are aware of it. And so there's a consciousness here where you can talk about these things in a way that Americans, for whatever reason, aren't even able to talk about the realities of it here in Panama the same things were done to them as it was done in the USA. So they talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have to come visit you. We have a question from the audience <laughs> uh, from Lisa D. What do you think of those who won't watch because they feel they can't deal with it? And I'm talking about black people. My timeline is filled with those comments. You know, you, you got to you got to take care of yourself. I mean, uh, I haven't finished seeing when they see us because it hurt me too much. It mm. just hurt me too mm -hmm. much. I, you know, like where you know something's going to make you just so enraged, you're going to have to go do something. Like that, that, that one hurt me, hurt me, hurt me. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, we have to take care of ourselves, especially living through this pandemic where reality seems to be like this crazy reality may go on for a long time. So when it's right, it's right. It took me, I don't think I watched The Wire until five years after it was done and I did it all at once, but I couldn't watch mm -hmm. it when it was, when it was happening. Mm -hmm. I told them before we, you know, joined the live conversation that after the second episode of this, I did have to take a trauma break. And I, I think there is no right or wrong way when it comes to, to watching, you know, something like this, because we know, you know, the, um, not only the historical impact, but just the emotional impact that it has on us as a people for everything that occurred. So I, I took a trauma break and I also um, decided to watch, you know, some some new joyful black comedies that are out to kind of balance it, you know, mm -hmm. like to just be able to say like, I, I need a break, but there's some also some dope um, black comedies out right now. And I'm like, well, let me catch up on those in order to just try to, you know, kind of regain some of that, but. Yeah, this is where you I, go to the absurd and, you know, the goofy and, you know, just to kind of get that, get your brain un, undone. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just appreciate that it's holding up a mirror to what we already know this country to be, particularly for for young non-Black children who might see this name here and there during Black History Month. Learn about something in some depth. And that's how you begin to to break the cycle. So. For the, the person who asked the question, I feel you. Sometimes it's too much, but mm -hmm. there are other people who need it to need to see it more than us. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully by being on a platform like ABC, it lands that way. Yes. Yeah. And to kind of piggyback off that, I want to know, uh, Tanya, what, how you feel about these people who there are people out there who say, you know, and they're black people that we don't need any more of these stories made. <laughs> what do you say to the, to them? You know, it's 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 so hard. I'm I'm I don't know if you all are aware of Dr. Greg Carr, and I've been in his program in class with Carr, and he talks about movement and memory as one of the Africana Studies frameworks, and we we have to we have to grab a hold of our movement and memory, mm -hmm. and our movement and memory extends beyond slavery. Slavery isn't our history. It interrupted our history. Mm -hmm. But if you aren't going to do the research and go find out the rest of your history, then you're just going to be as ignorant as the people who want, who are anti-CRT. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You are. That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, good answer. Good answer. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, I know our history is 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 known in this country of our mistreatment, of our enslavement, of our murderous, our murderous past. But you don't see the same outrage when it's like a, a brave. I mean, it's not the same thing, but it's like a, a brave heart or a gladiator. All these types of films where white people, Europeans are slaughtered. You know, you don't see white people going, we don't need to see no more of those kind of movies. They love it. They relish they it. it. They relish in it. And so, you know, our past is ugly. No matter what we try to hide or try to sweep it under the rug, we have a very ugly, disgusting past and that continues to reap its head in our but current also, era. And but we also have a glorious, magnificent past, which is that the people on the African continent did not genocide other people. When Zulu warriors went into battle, it was about demonstrating that I have the capacity to wipe you out, but we're not gonna do that. So now that we have shown you how good we are, we made a pathway for you to go home. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's this, is it, what is it? It's not, what, there's a game that they play in Africa where you always leave your opponent with one piece left because the idea is to never wipe your opponent out. So we come from a different, a whole different cultural meaning. Like we, we, there's no, there was no such thing as poverty in the, in the nations on the continent of Africa because everybody owned everything. They didn't have jails. You couldn't be poor. <laughs> so if, if you don't know that aspect of your history, then you can't even begin to understand the level of brutality that it took to, um, 
to, to make up this terrible story. And so they don't tell you about the 14 year old girl who poisoned all of the people in her house. They, they don't tell you about all the uprisings that were going on and the, the way we were running away and killing. We, we weren't, it wasn't like we were just all getting beat down and taking it. That's, that's not, that's not our accurate history either. Facts. They yeah. tell the story that they want us to, you know, keep inside of us as a memory of our history and be ashamed of. But if you will research and, and let yourself move through that history, you will find that everything on the planet came from us. The Bible came from original stories from the Husea from us. All of it became, began on the continent of Africa in Kemet and Nubia. Well said. Well said. Um, we have 10 minutes left in this hour. Um it went so fast. Yeah, I know it did. I, I, I was trying to watch the clock, make sure that um, everybody gets um, that we got this good talk in. I feel like we could keep going. Um, what I want to I want to finish out and make sure we have enough time for everyone to 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 finish out with one thing that they hope that people take away from this. So we start with our guest Tanya and go around. What is one thing you hope that people take away from this? Well. For me, the thing I hope people take away from it is sometimes doing the right thing means going against everything that everyone tells you to do. I love that. I love that. KB? Yeah, for me, right now, just watching these first two episodes, I hope when people watch them, what they see is a Black family. Just, like, family at the heart of it, you know? I think so oftentimes throughout history, as Tanya was stating, we just were not viewed as, as human beings. We weren't viewed as people who really had these traditional families. And what I appreciate the most, like Tanya said, Marissa really wanted this to be a family drama because I think that's also an important part of the history. And so much of what Mamie did for Emmett was just purely out of her love for him because he was her son, you know, like it's a gross injustice what happened to him, but also this is her child. This is her son. This is her baby. baby you know, mm -hmm. all of this comes out of the fact that, you know, a mother truly lost her child in the most heinous of ways. Mm -hmm. And there is, it, it's, it's sad, but there is a little bit of beauty in seeing how she was able to rise and uh, above this and, and how she dealt with her grief and how her love for him was really so grand that we get to see it, you know, take shape in this form even after he passed away. And so I, I just want people to, to see her sacrifice, to see her as a human, to see the struggles and to understand you're not going to get a full glimpse because Black women are not a monolith, but you get to see a glimpse of, of the struggles that we go through and, and truly how hard it is, but also get to see a glimpse of, of our joy. And I like being able to see that duality through this project. So. Yeah, she had the great outfit. She was always sharp. Yes, yes. Oh, she looks good. Together. Yes. And even her being Beautiful. able to just love, you know, just, just being able to love uh, Jean in, in a way that we get to see on screen as well, just showcasing them, just being two regular black people in love. Like th those are things. Pretty black see people, too. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, they were pretty black people for real. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. Deandra. I hope that people continue to restore communities and villages and helping each other because those journalists and other people around her who encouraged her to speak her truth and tell her story in her own way. Sometimes we don't have that courage immediately. We might need a little bit of, of help or information or sharing or encouragement continue to encourage your fellow, your fellow black people, lift them up. If you see them struggling, throw them a lifeline, help them, help them, help them, help mm -hmm. them. And I, I love that all those people gathered around her and not wanted to take it from her, but to encourage her and lift her up. So it would be more meaningful and more impactful. And it started, the, it was the catalyst for a major, major society shift. So I enjoyed that very much. 
Mm-hmm. I like yeah. that you said that the community had her back. Truly. They did. They did. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think she would have been had been able to do it without having her people behind her, you know, making sure everything was taken care of. You you didn't see her worry for anything, you know, and her and her mama wasn't doing everything for her. It, they had people. She had people. Mm-hmm. I mean, and- I even worried about her going to Mississippi. She was surrounded by men. I mean, so she didn't have to have Jean with her. So yeah, community. And you're right. I do like that in this story, you know, um, we know her parents were divorced and, and, you know, they lived in two different cities, but what I liked uh, seeing is the fact that both of her parents were there for her in their own ways, there to support her, there to help her with anything that she needed. And I like that they showed that because, you know, even though they weren't together, they came together for their daughter and their grandson in any way, in any capacity that they needed. And I like seeing that too. Absolutely. And I'll say, I hope people take away, you know, the black love, the love of, even the love of the parents for for her, for, um, for Mamie, for Mamie, for her son. I mean, I love that they opened up on her having, uh, just having this baby. And then the one of the last things you see is the body and the baby. You know, it's, it cho- shows the mother's love for her child. Um, and also um, the Black press. Mm. Black press is always out there, you know, shining a light on something, trying doing something that we ain't supposed to be doing, seeing stuff we ain't supposed to be seeing and saying stuff we ain't supposed to be saying. Um, but, but, but I want to talk in that press moment yeah. because, you know, the black press was always reporting the truth. So in many ways, the black people always knew what was really going on in the world that the mainstream media was not covering. Did so we told the truth about what was going on when we dropped those bombs on Hiroshima and all mm-hmm. of so We always know other than that, we if we have to pay attention. Our news is always telling the truth. Tell mm-hmm. 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 And even if yeah. we have to break down the door to get in the room, mm-hmm. we're still going to tell the truth. And, yeah, And ask well, the question nobody wants to answer. Or we find out the truth because we in the room and they think we don't have any power. And so they just treat us like we're invisible and just say all the things. And we just mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. keep talking. Say that. Say that. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I'm sure we all have stories. But yes, um, I, the Chicago Defender is my, my grand example. I, I read about, you know, the Chicago Defender being distributed all across the South, you know, 1900, you know, 1900, 1910, 1920 um, being distributed. And that's how people got their news. They smuggled the Chicago Defender down and, well, by train and, you know, With somebody throw it out into the field mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they kept they ground it up, take it home. And that's how they got word of jobs or whatever was happening, wherever um, black press. So black press, there's power. There's power in us. And so this is for, I think, other members of the black press that we need to see this to know that we have power, even if sometimes we don't get treated that way. But, you know, if it wasn't for us, that moment, this moment that made me needed, this moment that America needed would not have happened. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. We we carried those, th- those pictures, the black mm-hmm. press. The black press carried those pictures and that those pictures got circulated. Yep. Yep. So um, that's about our time. (laughs) Um, Oh my goodness. This has been a great, a great hour, a great hour and a great conversation. Um, So glad to be here with um, all of you. Um, And so I I, I guess we're going to just wrap this up by, first of all, letting everybody know where they can find you and, and something you're working on. Or, you know, something like a movie that came out last year that you did. (laughs) I actually have a couple things going on. So I am the narrator on a discovery piece called The Chicago Strangler, which is is about the 54 uh, unsolved Black women murdered in the city of Chicago in the last 20 years. So that show came out Mm -hmm. um, in December. Uh Um, And then I, Janita, uh, uh, interviewed me last year. My movie, Red Pill, is... um, available on all the streaming platforms. And I just wrote the book, Red Pill Unmasked, which is, it's a memoir and it's philosophy and it's black history and it's, you know, spiritual guidance on on how to live your life. Um, really getting to do this show and Red Pill and that they ended up coming out at the same time feels like kind of divine providence because Red Pill for me is definitely about the way a black woman sees America because we don't often mm-hmm. get to see our point of view on what America is like. 
Definitely, definitely for sure. Um, and that's how I that's how I I I bonded with that movie because of that. It's powerful. So mm -hmm. so yeah. Um, and when where can we get the book or when can we get the book? The book is out on Amazon. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, that's it's out on name. Amazon. Yeah, I'm doing the audiobook now. That's what I've been doing all day. I got about five more hours to go. <laughs> but you can hear me read the book to you and tell you all the behind the scenes stories. And I want to say about writing the book. You know, working with this Africana studies framework, it's like I'm decolonizing my mind and living in mm -hmm. Burma. You, you, when you don't have um, them around all the time, you suddenly realize that your thinking is very different. And so there's a way in which I'm writing this or the way I've written this book is for you to see. People often think, oh, God, Tanya, you can do everything. And, oh, my God, you're just so, and it's like, no, I let you see my petty, my whining, so that you can know petty and whining and all of that goes into accomplishing things. Like, there's no smooth road to anything that's worth doing. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. Um, KB, Giandra, y'all want to take it away? <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah. So you can follow me on uh, Instagram and Twitter only at the Lady KB, T H E L A D Y K A Y B. Um, and I definitely link, you know, a lot of my work there through the lens of Lady KB is my YouTube channel. So there are interviews um, that I post there as well. And again, you know, I am a freelance journalist. So I have bylines and, and complex and the beat and nerdophiles and a whole host of other places. So you can read about it, check it out. But uh, most importantly, I just want to thank you, Miss Tanya, for coming on the show. Really, really appreciate it. And I want everyone to check out the show. And then, of course, check out our after show. So, mm -hmm. are you doing this every week? Yes. Every week. Every week until the movie, until, well, the next three weeks because they're piling two, two, um, two hours a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Giandra. And also, I too am a serial freelancer. So please follow me on Twitter at Giandra LaBeouf or Giandra LaBeouf on Instagram. And please subscribe to my personal YouTube channel, Back Culture TV, where there are more interviews over there and other content and me eating serrano peppers and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just being a weirdo. Just. Come on by. Come on. <laughs> the fight reporting, the reports that you have, they, they, I love, the, I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> and I'm Jenny De Davis. Um, you can find me um, at, at the Black Cape. That's my little umbrella, Black Cape Media on YouTube. And um, we're moving the magazine to media, uh, to medium. So, you know, um, you'll, you'll just type in the blackcape.com and you'll be finding yes. us on medium soon. Um, yeah. and, and you can find me everywhere. My little, uh, thing is uh, right here at Jenny to L Davis, every platform that's me. Um, and my podcast, Creators in COVID, um, it, it's running every week. It drop the new episode drops to the public on Tuesdays. Um, and I'm talking to creative people about how they made it, made it through the pandemic. Thri what did they thrive? Or were you just, did you just survive and just made it? Um, mm -hmm. This week we talked to uh, an active a reporter who's an activist who um, she was embedded with the Proud Boys and 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 the, the anti maskers, but that took a toll on her. So um, it talk we talk oh, about man. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that. it's deep. It's a deep episode. So um, check out that and check out the HCA. I mean, first I want you to like and subscribe before you leave. I see a lot of y'all have already gone, but when you come back, like and subscribe because we have a lot a host of shows that come on every single day here. Um, this is not the only one and it will not be the last one that is, you know, black that you see all of our faces and especially black women um, on and talking about um, the show and others. So, and um, yeah, so, okay. Last thing I, <laughs> I had a moment. Um, last thing, come back and see us next week after um, women of the movement run, uh, runs after it airs, they're going to do two more episodes come back join us for another conversation um another guest hopefully um <laughs> so um so yeah um that's that's it for us um anybody got any other last words if not thank you so much for inviting me and it was lovely um meeting you giandra and uh kb yeah. lovely yes. thank you Anita. i appreciate you 
Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Queen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>